Hey everyone. I want to talk about touchback targeting. I wanted to talk about it a lot. I went to an Amata conference, gee, the last time was 2016. And I talked to many, many trainers about touchback targeting and asking them if they use this concept. And you know what? I didn't find anybody that did. And so I showed as many people as I could show, hoping that it would create an interest. Now, there, you know, I'm sure people do do this and they may call it something else and they may use it a little bit differently. But let me just explain what it is, because I've done a couple of videos on it recently and I've explained it and talked about it on podcasts. And you know what? I did not get one question or comment. Not one. Not one person going, huh, I've never um, thought that would be useful. Or, oh, I can see where that would be useful. Or, well, we already do this. Or, I'm going to try this. Not one comment. So I figure my videos just are not good enough. They're not showing what needs to be shown. But I also know that it's very difficult for people to watch little, smooth, um, non-dramatic video, right? Like if it has a story, that's easier. If it has, you know, catchy things, that's easier. But in reality, much of good training is a quiet, gentle conversation. It is simply the trainer revealing something to the animal, asking them to consider it showing them how it can work, asking them, is this clear? Can you do this? Are you willing to do this? Is there any problem? If I do it this way, if I make this change, would it make it better? Or as in the case of Spike the crab, he came up with a totally better idea. I came in to teach Spike and Spike taught me. That was an event. Anyway, so what is touchback targeting? Touchback targeting, if you don't remember from the other times I've talked about it, is where you can initiate an active contact with an animal just with naming something like saying, okay, I'm going to show you a target. And then you go in there, make contact, and there's a certain movement. And it's the movement that you use when, uh, you know, activating the latch on a glass stereo door. So you come in, let me see. Okay, now if you go to the YouTube version, you'll be able to see this. So you come in like this, come back halfway. See, don't I look like a hand dancer there? Because I am. Okay, so Mr. Camel, here's your shoulder. Can you touch your shoulder? Good. Shoulder, good. Shoulder, good. It's really that easy. I have had so many people tell me that you cannot teach shoulder and hip targets to large animals like rhinos and hippos and um, camels, giraffes, and you can't do it efficiently or easily. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. It really literally takes less than a minute per target site. Now, why do we want these? We want them for things like um, being able to position the animals so that we can take certain measurements or make certain observations. Let's say you want to check the heart rate or the gut transit. You put your stethoscope up on their gut. And you need them to come in close so that you can do this efficiently and effectively and without, uh, you know, you don't have to go in there and run them around. 
You don't have to go in there where they're like, uh oh, what's up now? You can just do it right through the fence in the morning when you go to check your zoo animals. You can get measurements, girth measurements, height measurements, temperatures, skin swaps, hair samples. It goes on and on. It's extremely useful. It also allows you to line animals up for procedures. For example, um, it's a little different, but we would target the muzzle or the rostrum of a marine mammal and also the flukes or the tail or the back flippers to line that animal up. And the trainer would usually be at the muzzle end and the vet would be at the end to end, collecting blood, taking temperatures, that kind of thing. Okay, and um, if you are a marine mammal trainer or a zoo trainer, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And come on, I remember when I first started training dolphins, they would jump on a dolphin in order to hold them down so they could collect a blood sample. Well, when you jump on a dolphin, how many people does it take? The dolphin's like four or 500 pounds at least. And it took four or five people. And the guy on the tail was called the astronaut. And, you know, you're just taking a blood sample. You don't want to get the animal all upset, feeling all violated, angry, frightened, um, oh, you know, disrespected. You don't want to do all that. Respect is first. In all of our relationships, it's like respect is the starting point. It's the most important thing. If you respect the animal, he's very likely to respect you back and to give you the benefit of the doubt. Lead correctly. So I don't need to tell you, I didn't want to continue that tradition. I sure didn't want to be the astronaut, but I also didn't want to have to face an animal after that experience. You know, it's like, yes, I'm the superior being and I need to get blood out of this little tiny vessel in your body. And so I'm going to lasso you and have a rodeo. Now, so what we do instead is we teach the animals what the procedure is. This is a needle. This is what it feels like when it goes into your skin. Look, I'll let you watch on me. Any leader does not ask others to do what they are not willing to do themselves. And it's very confidence building and relationship and credibility building to lead first. In any case, in this leading, we get to touch back targeting, you know, to ask the animals to hold these positions or cooperate with these procedures or whatever. We show them on the spot, you know, because it could be different today than it was yesterday. So maybe... Uh, maybe you normally just get a first sample, but today you need to take blood from the juggler vein. So you might have a head target up and to the side to expose the juggler vein and the shoulders and the hips to the, um, you know, interface, the barrier between you and the animal so that you can then collect that blood sample without any interference or anything like that. I remember doing some work with an elephant in the Netherlands and he needed to learn to get his back feet filed. And he, it was protected contact because uh, male elephants go through very dangerous phases. And there was a metal wall and it had blocks cut out of it that were large enough that the elephant could put his foot through and the trainers could, you know, file his feet and apply treatments and check things and so on. 
So he had to learn to target places that he could not see. And he did great. He did great. He had to learn to go someplace, turn around and back up and get his foot through this hole. And he did a great job. We didn't get all the training done, you know, in that one session, but we got a lot done. It's amazing. So it's a really important skill. And I said what the basics are, but I want to know what your thoughts are. Are you going to try this? Did you get enough detail from what you saw? So what I have done is I'm going to share screen here and I have a video. I just put a video up on YouTube that shows this, but here is another one. Here we go. I'm just going to play it. It's pretty short. It's two minutes and 14 seconds. We're gonna do some name and explain, and there's all kinds of things you can teach a horse or any animal by just naming them. And you don't need any special skills. So we're gonna show you a few right now. Can you touch X? Thank you, that's your nose, right? And I know you know this, but I'll just show people how we teach you. There you go, there's your nares, good job, your muzzle, your chin, beautiful chin, your throat, your neck, right cheek, left cheek, thank you, yeah, I think so too. Okay, how about your nose, when you're ready, nose, good, 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 good. Right eye, good, you see your clothes here? Yeah. Can I clean your Mine. eye for you please? I see a hair and it, maybe that can help, come in. Good, 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 good. That a girl, thank you. And then can I clean your left eye? Here, good girl, come on up. Looks like you got a hair there, I can't tell for sure. Okay, girl. Good, 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 good. In your right, your left eye. Good job. And that one looks pretty clean. Good job. All right. Left ear. Good, 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 good. Oh, that's your left nares. Left ear coming down for me. Good, 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 good. Oh, yeah, that's the one. That's the one, girl. Yeah. Right ear. Good, of course, good job. Okay, there you go. So just some face parts, right? Now, what about directions? We'll do that next. Okay, so what do you think when you see that? Uh, I'm gonna turn the sound off this time and just go through it with you. So here's Sarah and she's just waiting and watching. Now the first thing you notice, no lead, no halter, no anything. You also notice she's not in love with having me clean her eye. She has a repeated drainage issue in her right eye. And yet I need to do that for her because if she has any goop in it, little hairs that come off of her, you know, face and ears and mane and so on will get caught there and cause irritations that can really escalate. So we start out and do you see how quiet and refined her interactions are? They're not, you know, she doesn't move in big movements and bump into things or anything else. She is very specific. Now, what you're seeing here is I'm touching things and naming them. And I wanted to show you that because I talk about touchback targeting, 
before you start doing touchback targeting, you need to name body parts. There has to be a recognition that there are, you know, you're not just in a body, the body has pieces and the pieces have names and we're going to talk about the pieces and what we're going to do with them and so forth. And for that, that's even easier than touchback targeting because you simply touch the body part and name it at that moment. So I'm going to play a little bit more here. So you can, I'm explaining it there. And then I'm going to come in and target her muzzle. I'm just going to say touch. Good, there it is. Now, do you see I presented the target just a little bit away from Sarah? So she didn't have to, you know, run up to it or anything like that. And I wasn't in her way. I didn't invade her space. And she was equally as respectful and careful about me. Okay, now I can see, I think I'm looking right at her eye. Well, let's see what other body parts we do here. And you see, she's very interactive. She comes forward, she invites me to take her nostrils, her lips, her chin. I have talked to professional, professional horse trainers that felt like chins were very sensitive. And I haven't found chin targets to be a sensitive issue at all. I use chin targets all the time to teach horses to back up. So instead of putting a halter on them and pulling them backwards or using pressure and release and uh, kind of shooing them away, I simply teach them a chin target and then move that target backwards. And if you go and see the uh, recent Sarah video on my YouTube channel, you'll see exactly that process. And it's winter time and Sarah has significant arthritis and um, she doesn't move backwards as easily as she did, but you know what? It's just as important as it ever was because Building muscle mass is always important. And one of the better ways, one of the better exercises that helps them to build muscle mass is backing up. Okay, so we need to do that. And having this chin target gives me an easy way, wherever I am with her, whether I have a halter on her or not, to say, hey, can we just practice a few repetitions of this thing right now? Okay, so we'll continue with the body parts. So we're doing the chin and the stroke. You see how relaxed she is? She closes her eyes. And Sarah's really sensitive to touch. And there she's going as I touch her cheeks. And you see she she uh, releases. She does a lot of lip smacking and so on. And there's the eye. And again, she's cooperating. Because Sarah is so sensitive to touch, she really doesn't want to be touched in general. She does like to get brushed. And she will gently come up and, um, you know, touch me, but she's very respectful. And she doesn't even, there's very few places she even wants to be scratched. You see later on, she enjoys it in her um, ear. But anyway, I'm able to clean her eye even though she doesn't want to do that. And she offers her other eye. But she's always ending the session. You, you know what I mean? She's She moves away. As soon as she's met the criterion, she moves away. And there she's putting her hand, her ear into my hand. And there it seems like she does enjoy that. And now the other ear, and she moves it right in there. She takes mercy on me. Okay, and that's all there is for that particular thing. Why do we need to do ears? Sometimes we need to clean them or trim them, check hearing. Uh, we need to put things on around the ears, like pole caps if they're going to go in a trailer or, you know, their bridles and halters and things like that. Eyes. As my horses have gotten older, I really need to be able to watch their eyes and treat their eyes. 
I often spray them with a special eye wash, clean them, put ointment in them, clean them all the time. And it's just so important. Okay, so please gratify me. Please look at these touchback targeting videos and get back to me. Let me know, do you do this? Will you try this? If you have a dog instead of a horse, it's still really good to do this. And if you want to see a great example of somebody do with it, doing this, search my channel for Sue Ketland and Squidgy. She gives all kinds of examples of using touchback targeting. And it's an amazing little video that she put together. Okay, so thank you. And I look forward to next time. And I really hope you'll leave some comments. Okay, I really, I'm so excited about this particular technique. And I know how useful it is. And I want you guys to love it too, right? I have a complex about it. All right, thank you. Take care and we'll see you soon.